um, there have been claims made by uh, uh, various uh, players in the in the uh, privacy world about the failure of anonymization. Uh, so examples of some of these claims include that uh, you know, this is a quote from Ohm in, in, a, in a report that he put out at the end of last year. Uh, computer scientists have undermined our faith in the privacy protecting power of anonymization. Uh, you know these advances should trigger a sea of change in the law and uh, Cynthia Dwork made a comment at a workshop um, earlier this year irrefutable empirical evidence that anonymization is broken these are very big words uh, and, and very big statements and uh, they're they're put out so broadly so, so the purpose really was to try to analyze those statements and analyze the examples and analyze the evidence that was provided um, by Paul Ohm and Cynthia Dwork and others I mean they're, they're not uh, the only ones there have been a, a, others who've made similar claims, um, a good number of them computer scientists, um, and uh, the, the, the purpose was to analyze this, this, these claims and, and determine whether the evidence really supports those claims and to what extent is it supportive of those claims. Uh, the other issue is, of course, policymakers are listening to those claims and I've spoken to policymakers and they're concerned um, when they hear statements like that and they want some clarity on the, the power of anonymization and what it, what its strengths and, what, and weaknesses are uh, in, in practice. So um, in, in, a, in a lot of that work, the, 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 uh, uh, those individuals present evidence of actual examples of what they claim to be successful re-identification attacks. Um, so they say that there is evidence that re-identification attacks have been successful, therefore anonymization does not work. That's generally the, the, the uh, argument that's being made. Um, and what I will plan to do today is to go through that argument and analyze all the evidence that we can find and uh, start poking holes at it and, and see where we end up at the end of the day. Um, and just to, to summarize what we learn at the end of this is that the evidence that's is most often cited by those individuals does not does not actually show that uh, either that re-identification was successful or that the data that was attacked was actually anonymized. So you really have two flaws in the argument. One is that uh, in some cases the re-identification itself was not successful, um, and in other cases uh, the data set that was successfully so-called re-identified was not actually anonymized anonymized data sets. And I'll go through a number of examples to to uh, clarify that point. So we, we did a review of the of all the material that's out there and uh, we found 21 different empirical studies uh, so these are not theoretical these are not um, you know analyses of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, you know methods or these are real empirical studies with actual data and, and actual re-identification attempts um, and uh, real-world examples. And we wanted to see what we can learn uh, about identification from these examples. Uh, we, we limited this to, the, uh, to, to studies or, or evidence that uh, looked at identification using demographic variables. So we didn't go into the area of genetic information and uh, how genetic information can be re-identified. Uh, that's a, a more complex issue and we'll definitely deal with that in a future uh, uh, webinar. But for the for the current analysis, we focus only on studies of, that look at demographics, which are really the most common types of information that are used for re-identification uh, in in clinical data sets, uh, and certainly the most common type of clinical data sets that we deal with and that we see most often. Um, also, the the most of the evidence cited by those who talk about anonymization failures refer to these same kinds of studies. So we're really just trying to address those claims. Um, so just to provide a little bit of background, and this will help us analyze the uh, the the, the uh, evidence that that I'll I'll talk about later on. Um, so for each one of these data sets that is being re-identified, we we um, can classify the variables uh, generally into directly identifying variables. So these would be things like you know names, full addresses, uh, social security numbers. Uh, health insurance card numbers generally considered to be direct identifying variables and then quasi identifiers or indirectly identifying variables like the, the date of birth, the postal code or zip code, um, any other kind of date actually admission, discharge, uh, birth, death, uh, visit date, specimen collection 
and any kind of location information so postal code or zip code would be a good example and then you have the sensitive variable so this is an important distinction um, and then the, the, the second back piece of background that I wanted to show, uh, and this is important for the current analysis, is to look at the, the, the levels of identifiability. Um, because the, the, for data to be considered uh, anonymous or de-identified properly, it has to be level 4 on this model. So this is a 5-level model, and um, it, it goes from level 1, which is, which is uh, readily identifiable data, to, to level 5 which is, uh, would be considered uh, um, aggregate data. And as you move up, there, there, um, more de-identification is being applied. So the first level and the basic level of de-identification that's applied is, is to mask the data. Um, and this basically means uh, um, ob obfuscating the, the direct identifying variables. So this would mean removing the direct, uh, direct identifiers, the, the names, or replacing names with random names, um, generating random social security numbers or health card insurance numbers, uh, and uh, or, or replace them with pseudonyms. Um, and uh, there are two kinds of masking: there's reversible and irreversible masking. It's also sometimes referred to as coding uh, or pseudonymization. Uh, so that deals mainly with with the direct identifying variables. Now, mass data is still identifiable data. It's not de-identified data. This is really very important because a lot of the studies that have re-identified data sets have re-identified masked data. Re-identifying masked data is trivial because this data is not de-identified. The next level, level 3, is, is uh, exposed data. And um, it's exposed data because the data custodian has attempted to, ma to, to deal with the quasi-identifiers but didn't do a good job at it. Um, and uh, level 4 managed data they're starting to do a good job at it. And the difference between level 3 and level 4 is that at level 4 you're able to, man to measure the risk. Once you're able to measure the risk, then you can start making defensible statements about identifiability. So level 3 uh, custodians or custodians who release level 3 data are not able to make any uh, objective, um, quantitatively justifiable statements about identifiability. They do what they think makes sense. Um, what the other organizations in their space do or uh, what they've always done in the past uh, and say well this this is what everybody is doing we're going to release this data as de-identified but in fact without measuring the risk you're exposed and then at level four you measure the risk and you're able to make quantitative statements about the risk of re-identification and once you can measure the risk you can determine whether it's um, below some acceptable threshold of identifiability or above some or or above that threshold. If it's above, then it's not personal information, and if it's below, then it uh, it still is personal information. And then at the top, aggregate data. These are just counts without any quasi identifiers, uh, and these would clearly be not identifiable because there are no quasi identifiers in that data set. So this uh, I think is, is is a very useful model for us to reason about the evidence that I'll, that we'll go through, uh, mainly because a lot of the uh, data sets that have been re-identified are level 2 and level 3 data sets. Um, there is no example uh, that I know of that where a, uh, a level 4 data that's been properly de-identified has actually been re-identified. Okay, this, is, this is really important to note. So as we look at these 21 studies, uh, let's just determine what evaluation criteria we're going to use. Um, so um, some of the of these uh, um, analyses or studies um, only look at risk. They only measure risk. Okay, so they look at the risk of re-identification. They evaluate, be either through estimation or, sh or measurement, the risk of re-identification, but they do not actually attempt to re-identify a data set. So they may get a data set, they may apply some, some estimators um, or some models to it to estimate the risk, and they'll say, oh, the risk is 100, and therefore it's very high. Um, but no actual re-identification is done. So these would really not be considered successful re-identification attacks. The fact that you measure the risk of a data set and uh, you determine that the, that the risk is high for that data set is not a re-identification attack. The reason this is important is re-identification attacks are complex. They require uh, time, they require money, uh, they require skill, and they also have to deal with data quality issues. The real world has data quality issues. 
So measuring risk is good. It, it's informative. Um, it, it gives us a sense of what the risk would be in, in an ideal environment. But re-identification, uh, so, so risk measurement is a worst case scenario. Re-identification attacks, successful re-identification attacks have to deal with these other issues, the money issue, the data quality issue, the time issue, the, the skill set issues, and so on. So we classify the studies as those where uh, they, they um, measure the risk of identification or whether they actually re-identify a data set. Then the, uh, the next uh, question is um, whether the data set was properly de-identified or not. So was it masked data or, or properly de-identified data? Did they uh, remove the uh, directly identifying variables, they remove the names and so on and say we're done, or did they actually attempt to deal with all the other quasi-identifiers uh, in the data set? Um, and again, as you will see, a lot of the studies um, don't do anything more than just remove the names and addresses, right? Um, and then someone comes and re-identifies that, which is really trivial to do. That's the second criterion, whether they, they actually, the data set that was released, that was disclosed, and then re-identified, whether they actually um, uh, de-identified it properly or it was masked, whether it was level 2 data or level 4 data. And then another important criterion is whether the re-identification, if, if a re-identification was attempted, whether the re-identification was verified or not. Again, this is important because if you get, as a hypothetical example, if you get two data sets and uh, match them, um, and um, uh, you, you find some matches, uh, and uh, you know the matches are exact matches, that does not mean you've re-identified anybody because um, unless one data set is the, is the complete voter list of everybody in the population and you matched against that, then uh, you will not know whether that was the correct match or not. So in most cases when you re-identify, you would want to verify the matches to make sure that they're correct. Um, and then, you know, some of them do, some of the studies do, some of them don't. But this is an important distinction. Your re-identification cannot be believed really unless uh, a verification of the match has been made. Okay, so I'll go through a couple of well-known examples just to give you a sense. Um, and uh, if we have time at the end, um, I suspect we will, but if we have time at the end, then I will um, go through some more examples. Okay, but I'll just go through the, the, the uh, big ones first. Um, and a, a question just, just came in, and what, what, is, what do you mean by masked data? So masking is, is when you deal with the directly identifying variables only. So you, you replace, let's say, names in the data set with pseudonyms or with fake names. You replace um, health card numbers with fake health card numbers. Uh, so it's the basic level of anonymization where you deal with the directly identifying variables only. Okay, so go, going back to uh, example one. Uh, so this is a story about Governor uh, William Weld of Massachusetts. This happened pre hippa days, late 90s. Um, he was uh, uh, giving a presentation. He fell off a stage. Everybody was curious what was what was the matter with him, what happened. Um, and um, so a researcher uh, obtained the, uh, the data set from the Group Insurance Commission, which was responsible for purchasing health insurance for state employees in Massachusetts. And this, this had data on, at the time, 135,000 state employees and their families, and it was released after being anonymized. So what they actually did was remove the names and full addresses. So this is masked data. They removed the names and addresses, they left date of birth, they left the full zip code, they left the gender, and of course all the relevant transactions in the for the insurance claim, you know, procedures and so on. Um, so so a, a researcher came and matched the database with the voter list for Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right, so matched the GIC data set with the, with the voter list, and six people in the database had the same date of birth, three of them were men, and only one in the governor's five-digit zip code. So his insurance record was, was re-identified um, and it was determined what was wrong with him from that information. Um, so this is an often cited example of, of uh, re-identification attack. And uh, in this particular case, um, it was a re-identification, so re-identification did occur. It was successful um, in that the, the record was matched to an identity. 
and you can argue that it was verified because uh, the matching was done with the population registry which is the voter list and therefore uh, the, the governor was re-identified. Um, however the data set here was a masked data set. Okay. Um, and this is again, this is an often uh, cited example of, uh, of a successful identification attack. Uh, the second example, which is again often cited, uh, and it's cited by, uh, again, the, the, the two individuals whom I quoted earlier on, uh, is the AOL uh, example. Uh, and this particular case, AOL released anonymized data on around 20 million discrete search queries for over 650,000 individuals uh, who used their, their search engine and they made this information publicly available for researchers. Um, and the records included date and time of the query and the website that was clicked on as well as a unique identifier for each uh, user so that records for uh, all the search searches for any individual user can be linked to each other and you can see what any individual user had uh, had actually searched for. Uh, so these are the kinds of, of uh, uh, pieces of information that were included in there. The user number 2178 looked for foods to avoid when breastfeeding. Someone looked for calorie counting. User 355202 looked for depression and medical leave. So, you know, relatively sensitive information. Um, and you know, there's a lot of information about the kinds of things that people look for in, in search engines. Uh, some of it tends to be quite personal. Um, but the interesting thing is user 4417749 and uh, uh, so when when the a when AOL released the data set uh, the New York Times uh two New York Times reporters uh took the data set and they were able to determine the identity of 4417749 um so the kind of queries that user had entered were tea for good health numb fingers hand tremors dry mouth 60 single man dog that urinates on everything landscapers in Lilburn Georgia home sold in Shadow Lake subdivision, Gwinnett County, Georgia. So the, ter the searches are very, uh, very, getting very precise. You can tell probably female, 60s, has a dog, and lives in Lilburn, Georgia, probably Gwinnett County. Um, and of course they were able to re-identify uh, Thelma Arnold, 60-year-old widow, um, and she had dogs, and, um, and then, you know, they had a picture of her on the, on the, on the uh, uh, in the New York Times uh, and of course she was horrified and shocked. Now um, in this particular case again this was a successful re-identification attack and the match was verified because they contacted her and verified that, that uh, it was her um, but again the data that was disclosed by AOL was masked data so uh, all they did was uh, remove the actual names from the from the data set. Uh, nothing more sophisticated was, was done with that data set than essentially replacing the, the user identity, the username with, with a pseudonym, which is the user number, right? So again, re-identifying mass data is, is uh, much easier than re-identifying properly anonymized data. I'll go through another example. This is a Canadian example. Um, so this was a court case in Canada. Um, the, the CBC uh, obtained the adverse drug event database from Health Canada through an access to information request and uh, they were doing an investigation on the adverse effects of a, uh, of a particular drug and they found a 26 year old girl uh, who died while taking this drug, it was an acne drug um, and uh, they wanted to do a story about that because they felt that there were some side effects to this acne drug and that Health Canada at the time was not um, analyzing the data they had to detect signals about this drug um, so they they matched the information in the adverse drug event database with the publicly available obituaries, and uh, they contacted. They found four families that matched for someone who died during that period, same age, female in that part of Ontario, and they contacted the four families, interviewed them um, until they found the correct family, interviewed the correct family, and uh, and then did a story about this. And they had a program that was broadcast a few years ago on the you know, Diane 35 drug and eventually Health Canada pulled the drug off the market. Um, now everything I'm telling you now comes from court documents because um, the, the CBC went back asking for more data and Health Canada refused to provide them with the with the province. So before they gave them information, more information, the second time around they refused to provide them with the detailed information. So they went to court and went all the way up to federal court 
and uh, in that case the CBC lost and the judge ruled in Health Canada's favor that uh, the province field should not be disclosed because it may be identifying in this particular case. Uh, but again, this is a good example of a re-identification in that the, the, uh, uh, the broadcaster matched the uh, adverse drug event database uh, with a publicly available registry, essentially the public obituaries, to re-identify an individual and then they did a story about that. So again, our evaluation of this example is that this was a successful re-identification attack. Um, the match was verified. They they contacted the family and they were able to uh, talk to the family and, and confirm that this record matched that girl or, um, who had died taking the drug. Um, and uh, now in this case, it's interesting because uh, Health Canada released the data. Um, pursuant to an access to information request, they're not allowed to release personal information. So as far as Health Canada was concerned, the data they had provided in the initial round was de-identified data. Um, however, the, the, the risk was, um, was not measured, uh, and, uh, or not appropriately measured anyway, because a re-identification was, was done uh, by matching to a public registry. and. Um, so, so in this case, it was it's not possible to, to it was not possible for them to make statements about the risk um, of of uh, reidentification on this data set, and they released it um, uh, as as I as I understand it with with the uh, uh, some basic analysis of uh, of identifiability. So these three examples um, kind of illustrate reidentification attacks and and how we would go about answering the, f the few questions that I mentioned earlier, the criteria that we used for, for assessing the, the cases. Um, and I'll give you an example of a, of a uniqueness, uh, sorry, of, of, a, of a risk assessment. So there have been some studies by Sweeney and Gall, um, and they use different methodologies to estimate the percentage of the population that is unique on their basic demographics, like date of birth, gender, and zip code. So these are examples of studies that measure risk. And you know Sweeney found that 87% of the population is unique on these three variables. Gold found that 63% are unique on these variables, um, based on analysis of census data. Um, but uh, again, these are risk assessment studies, not re-identification studies. Despite the fact that these risks that they estimate are quite high, um, and uh, also of course those studies that assume that if you're going to attack a data set, uh, you would have those pieces of information. You'd have the date of birth, gender, and zip code. Um, so these are good examples of risk assessment studies rather than re-identification studies. Okay, so now let's see what we've learned by looking at the 21 studies and applying the various criteria that I mentioned. Um, and these are the only 21 studies we found. I mean, we, we did a literature review and uh, we ended up with these 21 that were non-genetic uh, type, uh, type studies. And I can give you more examples at the end um, of, of the session. Um, if, if you're interested. So, so basically we find that just under half of the uh, of them were risk assessment studies rather than actual re-identification studies. Um, so 9 out of the 21 did not actually re-identify uh, any individuals or attempt to re-identify any individuals. Um, they, they were risk assessment studies similar to the Sweeney and Gold example that I, that I, examples that I mentioned earlier on. Um, and as, as I mentioned before, risk assessment studies are interesting. They don't take into account the practicalities of a re-identification attack, but also there, there are many different types of re-identification attacks. Um, so unless the risk assessment is specific to re-identification attack, a type of re-identification attack, they may not take into account uh, a specific attack that an, uh, an intruder may apply when they re-identify the data set. So they're useful um, for, uh, for our knowledge, um, but they don't, sign they, they don't deal with the practicalities of re-identification. So they tend to be conservative, basically. So of the, of the remaining 12 actual identification attacks, uh, one case uh, involved identifiable data. So uh, in that particular uh, analysis, the, the authors um, used identifiable information to get additional, more, additional information, more information about the individuals. Um, so so um, uh, and were, the, the argument was um, how you can use basic information about individuals to determine their maiden name, and the maiden name is, is a key piece of information for identity fraud and, and financial fraud in general. Um, so that, that wasn't um, started from identifiable data, basically. Um, six cases of re-identification, uh, the, the uh, individuals um, 
but the data set had only the direct identifiers removed, so this was masked data. Okay, so half of them were masked data, um, which means that the names and addresses were removed, but everything else was kept in there. As the example I gave you with, you know, the Massachusetts example with William Weld and the GIC database, um, as the example of, you know, AOL, where just the names were removed. Uh, one case, the direct identifiers were removed, and there was an attempt to obfuscate. This was the exposed data, um, and. Um, and the 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 the, um, uh, the 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 obfuscation method was somewhat documented as well. The other three uh, claimed they they masked the data, so they removed direct identifiers, and then they claimed to have performed some kind of de-identification on the data, but no actual details were available. And I've learned through doing this for for a while that when someone says we've de-identified the data without actually going and finding out what they did. You know, it's 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 just hard to believe that it was done well and without going in and, and seeing exactly what was done. So three examples where um, uh, that was the case. So in one in one example, the the data set was claimed to be factually anonymous, whatever that means. Uh, the other case that was the Health Canada CBC. Uh, the data was uh, that was released was supposed to comply with the Privacy Act, which means that somehow it was determined it was not personal information. And in another case, some kind of perturbation was applied to the data, but that was a um, uh, perturbation that um, was unknown. Okay, um, so nobody really knows what was done. And then one case, the the data was de-identified, but the um, the data was properly de-identified, um, and uh, uh, but the identity of the matches was not were, were not verified. So someone. Um, had a properly de-identified data, so this was a British example, um, and uh, this was data that was released to researchers uh, f um, by the um, census data, and uh, they were able to match the census data with another data set, and they, they found some matches, um, but uh, they were not able to verify whether these uh, matches were, were correct, um, the correct individuals or not. Right? So uh, basically, to summarize, that all of the examples cited by the critics of anonymized are, um, uh, first of all, either uh, uh, well, actually all of the examples that were actually cited were masked mass data sets. So um, these tended to be one or more of the six cases that I mentioned before that used masked data. Um, and then all the risk assessment studies were conducted by researchers. So the nine risk assessment studies were conducted by researchers. And all of the uh, the uh, remaining 12 identification attacks, eight of them were conducted by researchers. One was conducted in a hospital um, by the privacy office. Uh, two uh, were two occurred in, in the context of a court case, um, and one was was um, by by a journalist. So um, it the camp, this gives you the, the 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 lay of the land in terms of uh, who is doing this or who who is doing these re-identifications. Um, and the other interesting thing is that um, all of the risk assessments and the identification studies were essentially identity disclosure. Um, so when we talk about disclosure risk, there are really two kinds of disclosure. There's identity disclosure and uh, attribute disclosure. Uh, identity disclosure is when you determine the identity of an individual. So you, uh, of a record, you have a record that's supposed to be anonymized and you can assign an identity to it. Uh, and attribute disclosures when you discover something new about an individual without actually um, um, figuring out which record belongs to them. Um, so if all the individuals, say 20 year old males in a particular data set have a particular diagnosis then if you know John Smith is in the database and John Smith is 20 years old then uh, you'll know that John Smith has that diagnosis. So that's attribute disclosure. So all of the examples, all 21 of them were uh, essen can essentially be classified as identity disclosure. And this is very interesting because all the examples of identification on this kind of data that we know of are identity disclosure attacks. Uh, so attribute disclosure is, is, is been discussed. It's uh, plausible, important, but uh, the, all the evidence that we have publicly disclosed uh, cases uh, are of identity disclosure. Um, and then in terms of distributions, two of them were in Canada, one was in Germany, one was in the UK. Uh, and eight of them were uh, uh, conducted in the uh, in the U.S. So um, 
uh, large percentage of the reunification attacks were in the U.S., partially because a lot, there's a lot more research activity in the U.S. because most of the reunifications were done in the U.S. Um, and uh, uh, the the other ones were were uh, uh, court cases and and uh, uh, one in Canada was a court case and, and in a hospital. So uh, no reunification attacks, successful reunification attacks by researchers in Canada. One in Germany was by researchers. One in the U.K. was by researchers. So really, researchers are very dangerous people because um, they're the most active in, in uh, doing these re-identification attacks. So um, d just to bring this to, to closure, um, the, uh, I think the main point to take from this uh, is that um, the evidence that exists today uh, regarding the, the re-identification attacks um, really doesn't show that the identification or anonymization has failed. Uh, what it shows is there's been an, uh, a good number of risk assessment studies um, and a good number of, of reidentification uh, attack studies. Um, and in, in half of those reidentification attack studies, the data was masked data, so it was not properly de identified. Uh, in other cases, the, um, the, the, the uh, matches were not verified. Um, or uh, one of the other criteria was, was, was not met, basically. Um, so it's not a compelling story to show that it's easy uh, and trivial to, to uh, re-identify properly de-identified uh, uh, data sets. Um, so I would argue that the, the, the claims uh, for anything other than what I just said are, are misinformed and they're severely exaggerated. Um, the, the, the just, there's, there's no evidence that a properly de-identified set has been re-identified. Um, so uh, I don't know what else to say, just the evidence is not there. And the, the, the studies that were claimed uh, or that were used uh, in making those arguments don't actually support the arguments that anonymization doesn't uh, has failed. They just don't support them. So it's just a very strange situation where someone is using evidence that doesn't support their argument, um, and uh, uh, you know, very strange. Anyway, um, so I guess the main message is this: it's important to properly de-identify the the data set. Uh, and uh, I know that there's some studies going on now where individuals are trying to re-identify a, a properly de-identified data set, so a level 4 data set, and doing re attacks on that to see if it's doable or not. As far as I know, this has not been successful. As far as I know, nobody has re-identified a HIPAA safe harbor compliant data set yet. Uh, as far as I know, nobody has said my risk of re-identification is low, you know, 0 0.1, and someone has come in and re-identified it. So, I, and I know that there, there are attempts to, to test that assumption, but the evidence uh, that exists today doesn't hasn't shown that this this is this is doable. So um, these were all the slides that I had, and I was I was um, hoping to take some questions from the from the participants. If you, there's something specific you wanted to find out about, um, and if there were no questions, then I was going to go through um, a few uh, more of the interesting examples uh, of the cases. I only covered three of them, but. Um, I can go through some of the other ones um, and uh, explain where they fall into into our, our spectrum of of, uh, of in, our, in terms of our criteria, our three criteria that we use for evaluation purposes. So, if you have any questions at this point, please uh, enter them now, and uh, I'll, I'll respond. So, the the first question is, how do you convince people that a data set is fully uh, de-identified? Well, uh, I'll go back to my um, graph here. So how do you convince people that a data set is fully de-identified? Basically, you, you would do that by measuring the risk. So, um, you d well, first of all, you'd specify a threshold, a risk threshold, that's acceptable to the organization. Uh, and there are various ways to come up with this risk threshold. And um, uh, once you've established a the threshold, there are various ways to measure the risk of re-identification quantitatively. Uh, you'd look at which are the plausible attacks in, uh, on your data set and measure the risk for the plausible attacks and compare them to your threshold. And if it's, uh, the risk is below your threshold, then you're good. Then, then the data set is properly de-identified according to your thresholds. Um, and uh, if it's, the risk is above your threshold, then, then it's not properly de-identified. 
Now that raises the question of what if you choose a threshold that is uh, you know very high? It means you accept a lot of risk. Uh, that's a corporate decision or organizational decision, but normally if the risk of the disclosure is high, you set your threshold low. So for example, uh, if you're releasing data to the public, this is a public use data set, you'd set a very low threshold uh, because the chances of an attack are very high. If you're releasing data to a very trusted party with very good security controls, then you set your threshold high because you, the, your risk of disclosure is lower. So, so you take into account the overall context and um, decide on threshold. And in my previous webinar, which is also the video of that is now available online, uh, I, I've discussed this issue more uh, in more depth. Um, so if you want more, more information, you, you can go and, and uh, um, uh, go through that material. Um, so the next question was, if the uh, what if the, da the, the data had uh, only pseudonyms without um, without other variables being de-identified? So so that's essentially masked data. So in, in the clinical trials world, this is very common. Uh, in clinical trials, uh, you know, it's, it's called coding, and um, the the uh, the name and uh, uh, maybe date of birth will, will be uh, will be replaced by a pseudonym, um, and then all, well, actually date of birth is often kept. Usually the, the initial and, and date of birth are kept, um, and then a pseudonym or a key is, is generated that links to an identity, the full identity of the patient. Uh, so this is coded data, uh, and that data is masked according to our th these levels. This is simply masked data, and the risk of identification of that data is quite high um, because there's a lot of other rich demographic information about the patients. So, so masking in the context of clinical trials is really uh, doesn't really provide a lot of protection. Provide some protection, but not a lot of protection. So, pseudonymization is is a good step, but it doesn't give you the identified data at all. And as we saw, the six case studies that I mentioned before, um, where people were able to re-identify mass data using publicly available information. So the, the next question one was, uh, what should be done to prevent another case similar to the to William Weld? Um, well, as I mentioned, William Weld was mass data, and you would never release mass data, right? It's um, in that case the the GIC data, uh, the Group Insurance Commission data was released to the public or publicly available for a fee. Uh, again, these were pre HIPAA days. I assume this would never happen now. Um, but uh, that data was released for a fee, essentially publicly available, um, after only masking was done. Now masking is, is very common, uh, and uh, not for public release of data, but for, for uh, data sharing uh, and the claim that this de-identified. So, so we, we're not there yet. We're far from being there. It's just very important to understand that masking does not protect you. Masking does not uh, reduce the residual risk to any acceptable level. So I think part of it is to educate the community that masking is a good step one, but it's not the the uh, the final step uh, in um, uh, in addressing this issue. Just going to wait for a couple more seconds to see if there are any more questions. Then maybe I'll I'll go through uh, a, a few examples. So actually, what I will what I will focus on uh, are um, examples of of re-identification rather than examples of of um, um, actual uh, of risk assessment. So maybe I'll talk about the Netflix example because that's that always uh, uh, brings out lots of emotion. Um, so what a uh, a couple of research. This is a very highly often cited example of re-identification. So in this particular case, the um, the a pair of researchers um, took the publicly available Netflix uh, data set. So this was a data set of movie ratings that was made available by Netflix to promote research on recommender algorithms. Um, and so they took this data set and they matched it with uh, another data set uh, for, for the IMDB database, which is a, a publicly available movie rating site, basically. And they obtained the, the data from IMDB. So IMDB had identity information and the Netflix data had no identity information. And the researchers then matched the uh, the data set from uh, Netflix the da Netflix data set to the uh, uh, IMDB database and they found a few matches uh, so if we apply our criteria uh, to that um, 
that um, first of all the, the the matches were not verified so um, the in one version of the paper uh, they uh, they mentioned that two of their students were were in the data set could identify themselves in the data set but in subsequent versions that was pulled out and I suspect it had to do with research ethics and uh, identifying your the data of your students um, but anyway uh, the, the, what survived all the reviews was uh, two matches between Netflix and IMDB that were not verified um, so so by our criteria this there, there's this was an unverified match and I mean if you have two databases that that are you know if, if you imagine that um, out of all all the people who who watch movies and rate movies you have two databases um, and then you match them and you find some some uh, exact matches uh, you know it's obvious that these exact matches will not necessarily be correct matches because you don't have the whole population of movie raters in those databases so um, th there, there, there's, there's some statistical arguments that, that are, raise a lot of questions about the, the, the uh, correctness of that match but nevertheless the, the bottom line is the matches were not verified so, so um, we don't know whether these were correct matches or not um, another uh, example uh, is the uh, this was an, an example of a of a hospital uh, so this was a Canadian example in a hospital and um, this was data that was to be uh, disclosed to a, to a prescription record to be disclosed by a hospital and uh, to a commercial data broker and the commercial data broker um, claimed that they were collecting this data already from a hundred uh, hospitals across the the country and they're asking for information like the uh, the first three characters of the postal code, the uh, date of birth of the uh, of the patient, the date of admission and the date of discharge, gender, uh, and then as well as all the prescription information. And uh, and again, they were claiming that this is de-identified data because we're not collecting any names or or any any such information. Um, and uh, so when when the request came to the hospital. The uh, um, the individual of the hospital basically asked around if anybody knew a patient who was admitted to the hospital, and one person put their hands up and said, "Yes, my neighbor." They went to the hospital in that month in January. They were you know that age, uh, and here's their postal code. Uh, and um, um, by ma by just using these very s basic pieces of information and looking for records in that prescription database that matched. Uh, only one record came out that it was it was an exact match uh, over that period and uh, and this match was verified so uh, a phone call was made to that patient's house or, or actually it was a child it was a children's hospital so that patient's mother to verify the match is this your child did she come in at that time and took those drugs while she was there um, so that was an example of a verified match um, but again this was a masked data set because uh, only the names were removed and the the other Quasi identifiers were all there, so you know it took five minutes to re-identify that data set using the quasi identifiers. Um, so that was relatively trivial to do, uh, but again, this was a mass data set, so it doesn't tell us that the, you know it wasn't a properly identified data set, and so it doesn't tell us whether the identification was um, uh, worked or not because it wasn't even de-identified. Um, another interesting example is a study that looked at maps or geospatial information. And in this particular case, um, maps were being published uh, showing, you know, dots showing the locations of patients who had particular diseases, and um, the uh, um, so these again it was researchers who came and they uh, they took the low resolution maps um, and were able to identify the exact addresses of the patients in the maps. So essentially, re reverse reverse engineer the maps. In this case, you can assume that. Um, the uh, uh, the data set was verified because they got the exact address of the person uh, who was um, uh, the house basically that was on the map uh, but the original data set was never intended to be de-identified so they re-identified uh, map data that was never properly de-identified before it was published so um, again based on our three criteria it, it wouldn't pass basically as a, as a real re-identification a successful re-identification attack um, 
And uh, another example is the uh, uh, Southern Il Illinoisian and the Illinois Department of Public Health. Uh, the newspaper wanted the uh, uh, neuroblastoma cancer registry data. The public health unit said no, uh, went to court, went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Illinois. And uh, as part of that court case, the, uh, the cancer registry was re-identified by an expert witness. Um, and the, the cancer registry had information like the zip code of the patient's date of diagnosis, um, and other basic demographics. And the expert witness was able to re-identify the uh, the patients and uh, then sent the information to the de the public health department for verification. Um, so uh, so this was a verified identification and um, the uh, but again the data set that was uh, that was requested had uh, quasi identifiers left in it. Uh, so so I think it would. Uh, it would be characterized as a mass data set because it had a good number of quasi identifiers that were not uh, dealt with properly uh, in that data release. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and see if there are any more questions um, from the attendees. Okay. Well, I'm not getting anything. So I'm assuming that you're all satisfied with uh, with this. It was clear. Okay. So so I'll I'll uh, I'll leave it at that then. And I'll, as I mentioned, I'll put these slides on online. Uh, we're writing an article on this that that provides a complete table with the results and the references for the 21 uh, studies. So. Um, that article is is uh, going to go through the the publication process and so on. So, but it should, hoping that it'll come out in in the near future, um, and uh, so you should be able to see the detailed uh, analysis. Meanwhile, uh, if you have any other comments or feedback, please send me an email. I'm always uh, interested in getting feedback and uh, seeing whether we 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 made a strong case or not. That's always very helpful feedback. Uh, again, thank you very much for, for participating, and our next webinar is on the 5th of uh, May, um, So uh, uh, and it's on re data release from cancer registries, so if you're interested, please register for that, and uh, hope to see you or uh, have you participate in one of our future webinars. Thank you very much.